Hello, my name is Tony Hyman. I'm a director of Max Planck Institute in Dresden, in Germany, and I'd like to talk to you today about organization of cytoplasm. So one of the key questions in biology that we're all interested in is the following. How does complexity arise to molecular interactions? The things we're interested in, such as cells, are often five or six orders of magnitude bigger than the molecules that make up. So if you have a molecule over here on this uh, uh, scale, the cells, for instance, are 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 uh, orders of magnitude bigger than the molecules they make up. So what are the rules by which these molecules can interact to create these very complex structures, which are so much bigger than they are themselves? I've worked on this problem for most of my career in a small uh, nematode called C. elegans. And C. elegans uh, makes embryos uh, about 50 microns long, which are very reproducible cell division. There was a Nobel Prize won for the study of uh, various things in C. elegans, particular cell death in the adult. And one of the most important things about working on C. elegans is it's completely invariant. So the cell lineage of the worm, the, the way in which one cell goes all the way to the different cells of the adult is completely invariant. But also, the cell division itself is invariant. I've looked at many, many of these embryos over, this, over the years, probably too many to, to think and calculate, but each one of them looks the same as the one before. So this reproducibility allows us to study problems of organization of cells um, after, after fertilization. One of the key events in trying to understand the division of this nematode was the sequencing of the DNA. So the DNA sequence, um, C. elegans was the first multi-eukaryotic system in which the DNA was sequenced. And the sequence of the organism defines the potential catalog of genes required for its life. And C. elegans has, depending on the time of the month, about 20,000, uh, thought to have about 20,000 different genes. So what you can ask then is, here are my genes. Right, so the yellow represents the, the chromosome, and the black bars represent the distribution of, of genes along the chromosome. And you can ask, which one of these genes here is responsible for cell division? Of these 20,000 genes, which one of those are involved in this process of making the embryos and dividing them? And we decided to look at this problem um, because of the development of a process a technique called uh, RNA interference. And this discovery of RNA interference by Andy Fye and Craig Mello also won a Nobel Prize um, in about a, a few years ago. Now, the key thing you want to do, as I said, is to create the catalog. The genes themselves, um, when you, when you uh, sequence the genome, you want to be able to assign a function to each one of those genes. So let's say we've got 20,000, 25,000 genes you'd like to go through each one of them and catalog its function. And that has been something that most of bio biomedical research has been trying to do over the last 20 years since the sequencing of the human genome, is trying to assign function to each one of those genes. As I said, the key step forward in that uh, cataloging process of assigning function was development of RNA deference. And here I have a slide which outlines how we think RNA deference works and how we can use it to silence the function of genes. So the idea is you want to take each gene one after the other, you want to silence this function, and you want to ask, after we silence this function, what effect does that have on the development or cell division of the organism? So in our particular case, we'd like to ask, after we silence the gene, what effect does that have on the cell division? The genome-wide screening was primarily the work of two people, Pierre Gunsi and uh, Chris Echevery. And, and Pierre Gunsi um, uh, and Chris pioneered the techniques for doing this in, in high throughput. And they designed the following screen, where you took a genome-wide set of double-stranded RNAs, and we synthesized them, microjected the parent worms, and we looked for cell division embryo defects. So the idea was to try and film the cell division uh, for after RNAi of each one of the genes in the genome. And one of the problems you have in any experiment like this is 
we made about 45,000 different movies of these cellular sets. And how do you quantify this problem? What you want to get away from is this uh, an idea of saying, well, this seems to have a cell division defect that may have a defect in dividing the cells in two. And you want to be quantitative. By being quantitative, you can then understand a lot more about the particular phenotype. And we came up with the following method to do it, which is we design, divided the division into 47 different things that we thought um, could go wrong. And then we looked through the movies manually, and if there was a defect, we gave it a 1, and if there's no defect, we gave it a 0. And then we did each movie five times, um, and then we did five movies of each embryo, and then from that, we were then able to get a heat map where you can see that the colors represent the penetrance of the phenotype. So like 100% means that every movie that we looked at had a particular um, phenotype. And so by doing that for all the movies, we then ended up with what's known as a heat map here, which is the defect categories on this axis and the genes on this axis. And then you can see you have clusters of genes with certain phenotypes. So these ones, for instance, are required for chromosomes to form and segregate. What that screen did is it defined a catalog of genes required for the first cell division of a C. elegans. And for those of you who are interested, we put all the movies online at the website on the bottom of the slide. And of course, we're also able to divide up the genes into categories, the functional categories of genes that are required for particular different um, purposes. But one of the questions that biologists now face is that this huge amount of information is, how do we make sense of it? How do we make sense of this massive complexity? 800 genes is an enormous uh, amount of data to work with. And how can we make this simpler in a way that we can actually try and study particular problems? Because all we've done here is we've all we've done here is really created the catalog of genes. What you might call gene X is required for process Y. Um, and that of course, it's powerful, but it doesn't tell us how the embryo itself is organizing and dividing. And that's a problem that I've always been interested in. Now, one thing to remember, if you think about this question, how is the function of 800 genes coordinated? It's important to remember the following fact, which is cytoplasm is not an undifferentiated soup of genes. You can't think about the cytoplasm as a set of 800 proteins floating around um, whether, <clears throat> and, and somehow organizing a cell division. Most proteins appear to function in protein complexes with other proteins. And in fact, some of the protein complexes are very, very sophisticated with many, many different proteins. The ribosome, for instance, has over 100 proteins. Um, and so here are some crystal structures of uh, ribosomes and nuclear pore complexes. And Molecular machines tend to be protein complexes that are very complex. And that's one way that we can think about how to organize the cytoplasm, which is to say not what the function of individual proteins are, but what are the functions of different protein complexes. And because of the power of that approach, there's been a huge amount of work done on using mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry is a way of defining individual proteins, which has been very powerful for working out which proteins are in which protein complexes. And here I have a diagram of how um, we do these experiments, is we take an antibody and we immunoprecipitate one protein. Now, if the protein is in a protein complex, it brings down not only the protein that you're immunoprecipitating, but also all the other proteins in the complex. So if there are 10 proteins in a complex, you'll immunoprecipitate one member of that complex and then you'll bring down all the other nine proteins. Then what you do is you take that mixture and you hit it uh, with trypsin. So you add trypsin or another proteolytic enzyme and that cleaves the different proteins into their component peptides. The key thing with mass spectrometry, which has been known for many decades, is that the mass accuracy of the measurements are exquisitely sensitive. I'm not going to go into the details of mass spectrometry. You, there are many places you, you can read into that problem. But the key thing if, to remember is that mass spectrometry can, with exquisite precision, measure the mass of different peptides. And then what you can do is you can ask which peptides 
um, from the masses are like to be part of uh, different proteins, and that's turned out to be very, very accurate with modern mass spectrometers, and the latter allows you to define the different protein complexes and the proteins in those complexes, and that's what's been known as proteomics. And for instance, here's one study where we can look at the different proteins in the different complexes and define different protein complexes required for different purposes. And proteomics is a big industry now. Many people um, and many labs are trying to define the sets of protein complexes involved in very different processes. For instance, we might like to understand not what are the proteins required for cell division, but what are the protein complexes required for the division of a cell. Now, some protein complexes are more interesting in the way they actually um, function. And I, and I want to show you a couple of examples of those. One of those are polymers. And so here I'm showing you a microtubule growing and shrinking. And for instance, there are things like centrioles, which are also very complex structures. They're protein complexes, but are also put together in very complex uh, ways. And in the next parts of my uh, talk today, I'm going to talk to you more about uh, microtubules and centrioles and how they're put together. What I'm showing you here is a centrosome by electron microscopy. You can see you can see very little because it's a very fuzzy electron dense material with no obvious structure. What you can see is a centriole in the middle of the centrosome. Now let's take a component of the centrosome, say gamma tubulin, and we label it with GFP. Now gamma tubulin is a big complex of proteins. As I mean, it depends varies between three and eight proteins in different systems. If we label one of those components, we're now labeling the following the activity of the whole complex. Now, if we photobleach that um, particular GFP, in other words, we hit it with very bright laser light, so the fluorescence of the complexes in the centrosome is now bleached, we can look at the recovery of fluorescence. And the fluorescence can only recover by new gamma tubulin complexes diffusing in from the cytoplasm and into the centrosome. So that gives you an, an idea of the turnover of, comp of these complexes in the centrosome. If we do that, uh, we find that they recover very quickly. So if you notice in that movie, I photobleached the centrosome, and within 60 seconds, the fluorescence is already beginning to recover. Whereas the gamma tubulin complex itself turns over very slowly, many hundreds of hours probably. So that is a conundrum which we don't really understand, which is what are the rules by which the protein complexes, which themselves are so stable, interact together in things such as the centrosome or the kinetochore or other things such as the nuclear body um, to organize themselves? Just to give you another example of the cortex, which is the outside layer of the cell, I've shown you that's divided into two different domains, a posterior and an anterior domain, and those domains are defined by different protein complexes. And I've shown you an example of one complex over here, the so-called anterior par complex. Now, that, of course, is itself a relatively stable protein complex. But let's photobleach a component of the other compartment here and watch its recovery rate and see how fast it is. Bam, we photobleached it. And look, a few seconds later, it's almost completely recovered. So that's exactly the same sort of problem, which is what are the rules which keep these protein complexes um, in these compartments, despite the fact they're turning over so quickly. And in the other sections of my talk, what I'm going to come back to is talk about some of these, uh, these levels of organization in a bit more detail, microtubules, centrioles, and something called p-granules, and illustrate from these talks the different sorts of microscopy and the different sorts of problems that occur in trying to understand how these complexes are made up.